These opening words are from Philip Hewitt. From the fragmented world of our everyday lives, we gather together in search of wholeness. From many cares and preoccupations, by diverse and selfish aims, we are separated from one another and divided from ourselves. Yet we know that no branch is utterly severed from the tree of life that sustains us all. We cherish our oneness with those around us and the countless generations that have gone before us. We hold fast to all the good we inherit and we would leave behind us the outworn and the faults. We would escape from bondage to the ideas of our own day and from the delusions of our own fantasy. Let us labor in hope for the dawning of a new day without hatred, violence, and injustice. Let us nurture growth in our own lives of the love that is shown in the lives of the greatest men and women, the rays of whose lamps still light our way. In this spirit, we gather. In this spirit, we pray. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, everyone. My name is Donna Zimmerman, and I will be your worship leader this morning. If you are new to this church or our faith, you will find Unitarian Universalists journey down many different paths to discover our own truths and find purpose and meaning in our own lives. However, we unite in our belief in the worth and dignity of everyone. We believe it is our obligation to express our faith through acts of compassion, love, courage, and justice. We practice a life-affirming faith, a faith we each continue to develop for our own individual journeys. We are proud of and grateful for our religious pluralism. No matter where we are on our own journey of faith development, we all strive to live our faith through what we do and not what we say we believe. I want to welcome any first time or returning guests who are here with us today. We are so glad you have chosen to spend this time with us. We hope you'll feel welcome and want to get to know us. And a perfect time to do that is to join us for the refreshments and conversation after the service. And I do understand that we have a very special refreshment back there today. Also, be sure to stop by our welcome table at the entry and pick up some information about our church and our denomination. If you haven't already done so, we invite you to sign in as a guest and get a name tag so that we can call you by your name. We offer regular Learn About Us classes if you are interested in finding out more about our church or our denomination. Or if you are at the point of wanting to join our church, our membership chair, Julie Smithers, will be happy to talk to you about the path to membership. For any questions, look for someone with a little yellow sign on their name tag that says, new, ask me. Now, if you will please ensure that your electronic devices are silenced, we will enter into our sacred time together. We are a denomination that is not connected by a single creed we must all believe, but rather by a covenant. These are promises that we have chosen to make to each other in how we will be in relationship with each other in our congregation. We recite them every Sunday to affirm again our covenantal relationship. Please remain seated and join me in reciting our congregational covenant which is printed in your order of service. We covenant to engage one another with honesty, kindness, and respect, to value diversity, 
to seek understanding of our differences and practice gracious accountability with care, love, and empathy. We make these promises to those who are here and those yet to come so that we may be a safe, welcoming, and beloved community of acceptance, learning, and transformation. Now please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our call to worship. The words are also printed in your order of service. We light our chalice each Sunday morning as a symbol of our faith, and Claudia Marshall will now come forward and light the chalice as you listen to these words. This light symbolizes many things, including our quest for knowledge and growth. It reminds us that our faith challenges us to step out of our comfort zone and strive to make ourselves and the world a better place. It gives us hope that we can lay one brick upon another and build a path to understanding, justice, and fairness. It sparks a fire in us to move forward and not retreat. It comforts us when we experience growing pains as we confront entrenched thinking and open ourselves to new ideas. We undertake this journey because we know it is our responsibility to our values and our spiritual growth. Thank you, Claudia. And now I invite our co-director of Lifespan Religious Education, Beth Curtis, to come forward to lead the blessing of the backpacks as our children and youth return to school. Tis the season for new beginnings. The new school year is starting in the very near future for most of the kids and educators with us here today. Some are excited. Some are eager to start the new school year. It may be a new classroom, new teachers, new schoolmates, or maybe even attending a new school. Some children here are homeschooled or are homeschooling parents, and they have new beginnings too. A new year means new subjects, new levels of what we're expected to do and to learn. And some of us may be a little bit nervous. Meeting new people, new teachers, going to a new school, learning new subjects, all have something in common. They are all new. But we learn as we get older that new things oftentimes mean new possibilities. That new teacher could become your favorite teacher of all time. That new classmate might become your best friend. That new subject might be what you become passionate about and want to study for the rest of your lives. If you're an adult or an educator or someone who wants to participate in the blessing and you have a bag or a briefcase with you, I invite you to open it up and just place it in front of you or on your lap. I've opened up mine, so feel free. Any Children who have brought a backpack or bag, or maybe you brought in your invisible backpack. And sometimes people use the word forgot for invisible backpack. It's okay. You're all welcome to come up here on the chancel 
and sit on the steps. Or you can just remain seated in your, um, in your seats and open up your backpack. Does anybody want to come up? Okay, excellent. Now, the blessing. Uh, where did I put the blessing? Oh, shoot. Oh, that's right. It's right here. Okay. Kids, I want you to make a little pillow of love like this. Look at me. Okay, a little pillow of love from your heart. Now, you can close your eyes or you can open them. Awesome. Make your little pillow. Awesome. Okay. As we, your teachers, your congregation, get to know each of you, we are just blown away. Each of you is so special and so unique in such astonishing ways. You each carry magic and love inside of you. You show us every week that you care not only for yourselves, but for other kids, other people, and the world around you. And that is amazing. You are so confident, so courageous, and so strong. You guys are going to rock this school year. Okay, now I want you to open up your eyes, and I want you to put that love right back in your heart. You know you will always have it with you. Miss Heather is going to come up and give you something to start off your school year, so open up your backpacks. It comes from our heart to your heart. Now it's your turn. Okay, we're going to get that little thing from our heart first, but we'll keep you guys busy in the meantime. Okay, now it's time for you to find the blessings from your heart and make a little pillow of love. Let us extend our blessings to the educators and teachers who have it so rough these days. Let us extend our blessings to the bus drivers, to the cafeteria workers, the school maintenance people, to the traffic police, to all the people that give from their hearts to these children and who work to make them safe. And let us especially fill our blessings with love and caring for these children who are our future. They are super smart, super curious. These kids are creative and they make our world a better place with each of them. Kids, we are filling our blessings for you. Everyone in this room cares about you and we want you all to know that we are here for you. May you feel curiosity all your days. May your imagination catch fire. May you find courage when it is necessary. May you feel compassion towards those around you and they towards you. Now on the count of three, we're all gonna release our blessings into the air. We'll feel the blessings rain down on us, but these are special backpack blessings. So y'all need to open up your backpacks catch the blessings, or if you don't have a backpack, feel free just to catch a blessing in the air, okay? One, two, three, go. That was a good one. Blessed be. Our church is self-supporting through the generosity of our members and friends. We are a spiritual organization, however, we are also rational, practical people, and we are careful stewards of the donations entrusted to us. 
Thank you for your current ongoing pledge support to fund our programs and ministries, pay our staff, and take care of the necessary expenses to ensure our beauty and comfort in the building and the grounds. We offer you many ways to give, including clicking on, uh, clicking on the link on the homepage of our website, setting up a bank draft, scanning the QR code, just lots of ways, and dropping your money in the collection plate on Sunday. Yes, yes, we still pass the plate. This act of giving supports our values and is a community experience and therefore is as essential to our spiritual well-being as anything else that we do here on Sunday mornings. No matter how you choose to give, please participate in this ritual by taking the plate and passing it to your neighbor or to the row behind you. David Rolson and Marilyn Jones will now come forward to assist with the offering. I invite you to listen to the words of Douglas Taylor. I am learning to let my guard down. We all know about the deep instinct to respond to difficulty and stress with either fight or flight, with force or swift retreat, with decisive action or prompt withdrawal. When faced with stress or difficulty or challenged, I am learning to let my guard down. I am learning to be vulnerable. I am seeking the courage 
to be open. I would have my vulnerability be a choice made from my courage rather than my fear. I would have my vulnerability be a strength. May my strength be not found as a hard shell of defense or a sharp weapon of attack. May my strength instead be found in the open stance of kindness and empathy, like a tree bending gracefully in the windstorm. May my strength be found in a willingness to join in the suffering of others, like a forest of trees together in a storm. May I choose to be receptive rather than protected, sharing rather than shielded. In this way, may I face my own suffering and the suffering of others with a nimble capacity to respond with compassion. In this way, may my vulnerability be an invitation for others to meet me in the open field with a yearning for understanding and peace. I know this is a risk. I know I may be hurt. I know things may not go well, but still, I will seek the courage to set aside that closed fist, the stinging retort, the barbed judgment of others. I will seek within myself the strength to stand exposed and unguarded before the world, in the wind, open to difficulty, not because I cannot be any other way, but because I have chosen this better way. I am still learning to be vulnerable. I seek the courage to be so vulnerable. May I have others who can help me to be so courageous. May my example serve others as well as myself. And may my strength be our strength in sharing this life openly with others. Our speaker today is a beloved member of this congregation who we are fortunate will gift us frequently with his sermons. His more expanded bio is in the order of service, which you can read afterwards because you're going to pay attention to him when he speaks. <laughs> and now I invite Manny Andrade to come share his thoughts with us. Manny, this pulpit is yours. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be home. I'm going to start with a quote from uh, theologian Gregory Boyle, who says that the measure of our compassion lies not in our service to those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. How do we relate to each other? Well, in my mid-20s, as an airline employee, yes, I was an airline queen many, many years ago, I took advantage of my discounted employee travel benefits and took a dream trip to wander through Morocco. In the city of Fez, a friend and I hired a guide, his name is Yusuf. He guided us through a walking tour of the oldest part of the city. We encountered the Jewish quarter where towards the end of the 15th century, Jewish refugees from Spain settled after their expulsion by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. In that vicinity, we encountered someone asking for alms. Unsure of the local protocols, I was a bit uncomfortable, a bit embarrassed, and a bit confused. So I pulled out my wallet and took out a few dirhams and gave the alms and moved on. Yusuf, perhaps noting my discomfort, explained that in Islam, zakat, Z-A-K-A-T, or almsgiving, is one of the five best basic tenets of the faith. Muslims believe that giving to others 
purifies their wealth, increases its spiritual value, and causes one to recognize that everything we own is only held in trust. He went on to explain that in Islam there is no shame involved in asking for alms. Soliciting alms is a right, just as it is a right to survive and to live. That experience was an invitation for me to begin to assess the associations that sometimes take place when we encounter people in need. Unbeknownst to me, this was my first step towards understanding cultural humility. Cultural humility is an honest effort to bridge the gap of privilege between service providers and those in need of their services. However, it may also be easily applied outside the professional setting. I am struck by the parallels between embracing cultural humility and our UU guiding principles. We declare that every person has a right to flourish with inherent dignity and worthiness. Boy, that just goes right hand in hand with what cultural humility is all about. Frankly, I, I thought sharing the link between the idea of cultural humility and the UU guiding principles was just too good to pass up. It was, I've heard, I, I need to do this. The term culture is conceptualized to accommodate every identity that is significant to us or the folks around us. Think of culture in broader terms. This includes some of the basics that we already have known and heard about over and over again, such as skin color, race, ethnicity, religion. How about body size? How about economic status, education, sexual identity, gender identity, age, Family constellation, how do we each individually define our own families? Caregiver status, citizenship status, addiction history, trauma survivorship, indigenous heritage, ability, and beyond and beyond and beyond. How you define culture is based on issues of greatest significance to you. With a definition of culture this broad and inclusive, you'll find that in some way, every relationship becomes cross-cultural. Even someone who seems very much like us has identities that we do not hold. And every person we perceive as different will have some identities that we share. Given this broad definition, it's obvious that we move between several cultures, often without even thinking about them. The word humility is defined by Merriam-Webster as freedom from pride and arrogance, reflecting, expressing, or offered in a spirit of deference. The Cambridge Dictionary states that humility is the feeling or attitude that you have no special importance that makes you better than others. I kind of like that one. It puts us all on an even playing field. Approaching those around us with humility asks us to walk alongside others, to learn from them as experts in their own lives, and to be willing to discover where our own identities have shaped our views and what is normal and how we see what's healthy, how we see is right. It's a very individual assessment that um, we're all making. The first principle, which highlights the inherent worth and dignity of every person, encompasses two equally important aspects of cultural humility. First, we make a commitment to continually explore our own cultural identities, including how society values them, and how we've internalized those values, and to question how our identities impact our beliefs, as well as the stereotypes and biases that we hold. No matter how well we know ourselves, who we are will always influence our relationships. It will strengthen some and make others more challenging. 
we bring ourselves into every relationship we enter. When we examine our own cultural identities with compassionate curiosity, rather than being critical of ourselves or what we find, we're encouraged to remain open, to keep learning, and to be more conscious and intentional in how our identities inform our relationships. We can attain understanding of the inherent worth and dignity of every person by understanding other people's perspectives. This is a challenge because not all information about others is included in our personal radar screen. Each of us has blind spots, which is normal. We can't know everything. We can't know everything about everyone around us. And those blind spots give us no foundation to connect with other people. Have you ever slept in a homeless shelter? Have you ever been evicted? Have you ever filed for bankruptcy? Have you ever been jailed? Have you ever been hospitalized in a mental health treatment facility? In situations like this, if they're outside of your scope of experience, another person can bring us this not knowing to our awareness. Having people around who respectfully, respectfully challenge our thinking affords us the wisdom of differing perspectives. Because to exist in relationships with like-minded individuals is to remain inside a bubble of our own unquestioned biases. By practicing cultural humility within a cognitively diverse community, we create respectful thinking environments with others who experience the world from a very different vantage point. Added all this, and this is the thing that just I love, using our church covenant, we can create a fruitful place to support, or continue to create, because I see it happening, a fruitful place to support each other, to grow in love and compassion. We say, on Sundays, we covenant to engage one another with honesty, kindness, and respect, to value diversity, to seek understanding of our differences, to practice gracious accountability with care, love, and empathy. We pra if we give this to ourselves and share it with others, the door opens. In addition to expanding our understanding of culture, there are other aspects of cultural humility to consider. Historical awareness is very different in a time where in this state that is being denied and shut down and doors closed and books burned and turned away. This is a very important time to maintain historical awareness in our community. Cultural humility requires historical awareness. It is not enough to think about one's values, beliefs, social position within the context of the present moment, but to practice true cultural humility, a person must be aware and be sensitive to the historic realities like legacies of violence, oppression against certain groups and people. A classic example that we probably all, if you took Sociology 101, I know that you talked about this, is Public Health Services Syphilis Experiment at Tuskegee, where, and it's a tragic reminder of how African Americans have been historically deprived of adequate health care when they were denied treatment for syphilis. People have experienced abuse and disrespect in the name of clinical research. When I started working in the HIV field, many of my clients came to me and said, HIV was created as, as experiment to hurt people of color, to do away with uh, LGBT folks, especially gay men. This was something I heard very often. And why was this presented? Because there's a historical perspective of mistrust of authority in light of the vis-a-vis -vis these, uh, uh, these abuses. Think of the women in Puerto Rico who were forced to be sterilized in the 50s. They weren't told they were being sterilized. They were sterilized because there were just too many people running around and we 
choices were made for people. So, you know, uh, using a historical perspective to understand mistrust is very important. Recognizing one's privilege means being aware that some people have to work much harder for the same opportunities that others take for granted. And in truth, some folks may never experience them at all. It means educating oneself to the fullest extent possible so that you understand what's truly at stake. Having privilege means that one is in possession of unearned advantage in a society through some aspect of one's identity. These dynamics tend to reflect larger power differentials in society fo as folks who are members of a dominant group normally possess privilege over those whose identity marginalizes them by comparison. While it could be uncomfortable, oh, and it is, to recognize that you have unearned advantages over folks through no fault of theirs, Working through your discomfort can allow you to utilize your privilege in a way that promotes more equity outcomes for others in society. Intersectionality. Back in 1989, Kimberly Crenshaw first coined the term intersectionality to highlight the many attributes of one's identity. We've seen how diverse it is and how often we very narrowly uh, uh, identify culture. Intersectionality includes all the things that we've talked about and, and even some that we didn't mention. Crenshaw argues that without taking these pieces of someone's identity into consideration, it becomes difficult to understand the extent of an individual's marginalization. Crenshaw argues that the focus on the most privileged group members marginalizes those who are multiply burdened and, obs and obscured uh, claims that cannot be understood as, as resulting from discrete sources of discrimination. In other words, they're lost. Once you have an understanding of the aspects of your identity that afford you certain privileges, it can be helpful to reflect on how your privilege manifests itself in different situations. For example, you might take note of how your physical appearance, body size, and age offer you certain privilege over those with a disability. It's an easy comparison, but it's a hard one. It's difficult. If you are able-bodied, you likely do not experience people assuming that you are incompetent without ever knowing your work ethic and your abilities. By recognizing all the ways in which you are privileged, you will have a better understanding of how others become marginalized in systems that never made space for them. You can use self-reflection to address your privilege. Self-reflection is a great way to understand one privilege, one's privilege because it fosters critical thinking gently and being kind to yourself as you do it. And this way you can connect your, individually, your individual lived experiences to larger systematic realities. When it comes to using your privilege to help others, you can probably imagine many ways to do good. But often those with privilege fail to recognize how much harm they can do when they do not think critically enough about the power they hold. For example, my late dad, was a naturalized U.S. citizen who served in the U.S. Farm armed Forces during the Korean War. My mother and sister, who are visiting today, and I arrived in the U.S. as U.S. green card holders. We had green cards. Um, we were legally registered immigrants ready to start life in the U.S. My dad's U.S. citizenship status gave us an open door for entry to the U.S. and our life here, which by the way, it's like 50-something years that we're here. Um, as a social worker, I sometimes serve immigrants dealing with major illnesses who have entered the U.S. as undocumented refugees. The immigrants I refer to have crossed the border on foot through the desert, through the river, through the desert, in search of health care in this country. 
where there is none. I have somebody right now from Venezuela where a woman living with AIDS, a, a, a viral load of 5 million, a CD4 of 20, where in Venezuela there are no antiretroviral medications. She came here, went straight to the hospital with cryptococcal meningitis. Okay, Th this is reality for some folks. Um, in this instance, when I assess a client situation, my privilege becomes glaring in contrast to theirs. I am a U.S. citizen. I have no fear of deportation. My country of orange does not pose a threat to me. Rusty and I go to Peru every year because we love it down there. I have knowledge of systems available to support those in need. How do I use my privilege to understand how difficult it is for someone who doesn't have, and in gratitude for my situation, work to support those who are in need? Another example, if you are cisgender and you find yourself in a discussion about societal issues with someone who identifies as non-binary, you can acknowledge that your, F, your gender affords you certain privileges in society. By acknowledging your privilege, you limit the possibility of invalidating the other person's life, exper life experiences or silencing them altogether. It shows self-awareness, empathy, and compassion to those who are marginalized. It is also important to be mindful of your privilege. Listen a lot more than talk when engaging with members of marginalized communities. They have a wealth of information to share with you. In another instance, an able-bodied white woman may have fewer disadvantages than a white man who's dealing with a disability. Think about that. A acknowledging privilege in conversations can help make room for oppressed folk to express themselves. Having privilege can also lead you to believe sometimes that you've earned more than you actually worked for. I certainly didn't earn my status here. It was something that was handed to me in a silver platter. And I need to accept that with humility and gratitude. The more willing you are to think critically about privilege, the more comfortable you can become using your privilege to help enact social change, something that is extremely necessary for those who are continuously disadvantaged. Deep self-reflection can feel overwhelming, but it's crucial to put in that consistent effort in order to see a shift in the treatment of those who are oppressed. How do you show cultural humility? You use your privilege to help others. After recognizing in which ways you have privilege, you can use those advantages to help promote equitable outcomes for others. Cultural humility is demonstrated by observing one's own reactions and thoughts when interacting, interacting with people from different cultures and by first asking introspective questions, gently asking yourself introspective questions instead of applying and speaking a preconceived notion or stereotype. Cultural humility is shown by being genuinely curious to new ideas, which inevitably means challenging what is already believed is true. Remember that self-critique, self-understanding, is a lifelong process. Acknowledge power imbalances and work towards fixing them. Attaining cultural humility can be demanding. However, the payoff is attaining more intimate relationships with a deeper understanding of those around us. I'll close with the opening words of this sermon by the theologian Gregory Boyle. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service to those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. Amen, namaste, blessed be.
We will sing our closing song in the same manner that we did our first song. We've sung it before, but it's been a while. It's a very easy tune. Sydney will play through it one time so we can listen to it, and then our song leaders will lead us in actually singing it. It is hymn number 168, One More Step, and then we will remain standing for the closing words. Closing words are by Rabbi, Rabbi Karen Keeter, and thank you, Claudia, for extinguishing our chalice. Make me a vessel ready to receive the loving stream from a transcendent good. May it course its way through my discerning mind and complicated heart so that I may be a force for good. I call upon you, spirit of life, make me a vessel a mere image of paradoxical beauty, of mystery, of oneness, and love, and love. May it be so. Go now in openness, courage, and love. Amen. 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 <laughs>